Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the library. Um, we are excited to have today's event. This is looking at um, the American Revolution as part of our Hamilton uh, One Book, One College program. Um, we've been looking at the musical Hamilton, and we've looked at different themes. Of course, one of those themes is we actually wanted to look at the history itself and bring in a real life breathing historian. So thank you, Jim, for doing that. We have Jim McIntyre. Uh, he's one of our history faculty, and his expertise is the American Revolution. He speaks around the country um, on different topics related to that, and he's going to try to take the things we know about the American Revolution and open our minds to some things that we ignore, don't know, don't talk about. So with that, I will turn it over to Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. And, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Troy Swanson for inviting me to come in and speak today. Also, the One Book, One College Selection Committee for picking Hamilton as our text for this year. Uh, and so to start off, talking about the American Revolution is, is at once a lot of fun for me, but also very difficult because so many of the ideas, so many aspects of these events are so ingrained in American culture that they've become almost an American scripture. And to poke at that can, can get a little bit challenging at times, but I hope to do quite a bit of poking for, for the next half hour, 45 minutes or so. Uh, to start off, you know, again, most of us when we are in primary school, right, learn about Mary Ludwig Hayes, except we learn about Molly Pitcher, right? Uh, Molly, pictured here, was what they called a camp follower. So these were women who basic, oftentimes were married to soldiers either in Washington's army or the British army, and they really had nowhere else to go except to follow their husbands and they would do odd jobs around the camp. They would cook, they would cl uh, mend clothing. Some of them were actually prostitutes, though if they were discovered, they were rapidly kicked out of the army. Um, and so Molly's story is that June 28, 1778, at the Battle of Monmouth, when her husband uh, fell either being wounded or to heat stroke, she took his place and manned the gun and became this great patriotic woman, right, serving the cannon against the British. We don't know if she really existed. There's some debate over that. <laughs> There's some debate over to what extent she actually helped out. Molly Pitcher actually became a, a kind of slang term for a while. Uh, as Pitcher, as that implies, these were women who would get water for the men on the march or in combat, so it, she could just be kind of a myth or an archetype. But she does speak to something that did happen. Okay. Anyone ever hear of Deborah Sampson? Okay, no, no. Okay, Robert Shirtliff, probably not. Um, this is Deborah. This is her alter ego, Robert. Okay. Some women, there's, there's at least five documented instances we have where women actually basically dressed up as men and served in Washington's army. Robert Shirtliff is the best known, or, or Deborah Sampson. Uh, Alfred Young, who was actually a Chicago native, did a biography of her called Masquerade. And essentially, 1782, Deborah takes on the clothing and the name, uh, Timothy Thayer, tries to join this Massachusetts militia group. And she actually gets paid, again, uh, something because all Americans in the 1770s and 1780s were patriots, right? Everybody, you know, wanted to serve. By the end of the war, they were actually, by 1777, they were offering what were called bounties. So a signing bonus if you join. And she received the signing bonus, but when she went to sign up in Mid Middleborough, Massachusetts, one of the local merchants recognized Timothy as Deborah. And so the authorities tracked her down, and she'd already spent a lot of this money, but I think the recruiting officer felt a little bit embarrassed about this, right? Like, <laughs> how, did I, how did I let her sneak into my outfit? So they didn't really make a big deal. They just said, don't do it again, except she did it again. And she joined the 4th Massachusetts, uh, which was actually an, the light infantry, which was a, an elite company. And the only reason this started to come to light is about 30 years after the revolution, Congress uh, put forward the, these bills where veterans of the revolution could apply for pensions, and so she did. <laughs> um, this is another possibility of what Deborah may actually have looked like. 
okay, more, more modern rendition, if you will. And again, this you know, speaks to one of those big questions of the revolution, right? How revolutionary was the American Revolution to begin with? And we're often taught in school, right? This was, the, this was the beginning of all modern revolutions. This was this great sweeping moment. But to give you a kind of contemporary contrast, um, the French Revolution starts in 1789, and I'll talk about that more in a bit. During the French Revolution, the revolutionaries tried to get rid of Roman Catholicism in a country that was over 90% Roman Catholic. It didn't work, but that, that's a lot more extreme than we ever went. Right? The other thing that, that I think Deborah Sampson's experience speaks to is this idea of participation, which groups participated, who won, who lost as a result. Um, you know, many women played roles at different levels, and here is Abigail Adams, one of the better known figures from the period. And she has, in one of her letters to her husband John Adams, who was then with the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, she wrote, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. <laughs> and so she's kind of cautioning John. And later, actually, in 1780, she writes, Haven't we participated in your revolution? We being women. Haven't we participated in your revolution, too? You know, what have we contributed while, our, you know, tending the farm, making sure that the bills are paid while our husbands are off in Congress? John, right? Um, and, and there are some experiments, okay? In 1776, we declare independence, and the Continental Congress actually sent out this letter to a lot of the different state governments. They said, you know, a lot of you used to be royal colonies, and now that we're independent, maybe you should get rid of those old charters from the king, because that really doesn't work so well these days. And to give you an idea, Rhode Island essentially went through and scratched out wherever it said king in their charter and kept the same frame of government. Pennsylvania, by contrast, wrote an entirely new constitution. And, and again, this gets into things we still argue about today, right? Who participates, who doesn't? Uh, in Pennsylvania, they had all adult males could vote, okay? Uh, new Jersey, they actually, for a few years, women property owners could vote. In New England, in Rhode Island, where there were a lot of free African Americans, there was some discussion of, you know, allowing African Americans to vote in the 1770s, 1780s. Now, this all ends after the War of Independence, but again, they're sowing the seeds, right? You're starting these discussions that are still going, some of them still going on today, right? Uh, participation in society and so forth. Speaking of African Americans, Many did serve in Washington's army, but again, this isn't the way it's often depicted. Uh, there's a muster roll from 1778 where it basically, depending on how you read it, almost a quarter of Washington's army may have been African American. One of the problems we've run into is terms. Okay? They use the term tawny, T-A-W-N-E-Y, a lot, um, which can mean, you know, could mean African American, could mean um, a sailor, right, a white guy who's been at sea and gotten suntanned, because tawny basically means brownish. It could mean a Native American, okay? But, uh, so a lot of times that shows up, right, tawny. So maybe about a quarter of his army. Uh, there are some, some real concrete facts that we have. Okay, Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Green of Rhode Island asked for and was given permission to raise a unit, and, and they're pictured here. Um, all African American soldiers with white officers from Rhode Island, and the idea was that through demonstrating their ability in military service, they would show that they too deserve citizenship. Christopher Green was a very forward thinking kind of guy. Um, his, one of his colleagues, John Lawrence of South Carolina, asked the South Carolina legislature to do the same thing. They flat out said no. In the South, arming African Americans, arming slaves, not happening. Okay, uh, Which brings up something, again, in popular culture. If any of you have seen the movie The Patriot, and they have this African American guy standing next to these white South Carolina militiamen, didn't happen. 
<laughs> did not happen. Um, the closest you would come would be some of these, some of the South Carolina militia, yes, um, had their servants with them, but they weren't arming, um, they weren't arming them, okay. And it also brings up this issue when it comes to African American participation. It's, it's a mixed thing. Very early on in 1775, the last royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, uh, raised what he called the Royal Ethiopian Regiment. Basically, he said, anyone, any slave who runs and joins me, I will give you freedom if you will fight to put down the rebellion. Uh, and so obviously the idea of freeing slaves pushed many Virginia planters into the side of, you know, onto the side of supporting the rebellion. Okay? And this is an example of what they would have looked like. And again, think how they, they did actually put that motto on their coats, liberty to slaves. Imagine how that's going to play with southern planters. Right? This is not going to go over very well. Um, if there was a group who certainly lost, it would be Native Americans. This is Thani Andega, also known as Joseph Brandt, so we'll go with Joseph Brandt. Uh, it's a little bit easy. He was an anglicized Mohawk. He had actually been to England a couple times. And most, most Native American groups sided with the British because it was in their interest to do so. Uh, the British had supported this proclamation of 1763, which stopped colonial expansion, at least for a time. Uh, gave them some breathing space. They, they wanted to preserve hunting grounds for the fur trade with the Native Americans. And, but some did actually serve on the Patriot side. And you have one here. The Stockbridge Indians actually sent contingents to George Washington. Um, they served as scouts and guides throughout the war. They were at Valley Forge. They still lost their lands in Massachusetts and eventually were driven up to Wisconsin, uh, forced resettlement westward. Okay. One topic that's come up recently, there have been a number of books on what the, what the revolutionary generation, what did the founders actually believe okay. in, religious, in regards to religion. And a lot of the ideas have been put out that the founders were these conservative Christians. They weren't. Uh, I'll go through a couple of quick examples. Thomas Jefferson, always the interesting one. Jefferson developed his own version of Christianity, and he was about the only one who followed it. <laughs> uh, he's almost a deist. Ben Franklin most likely was a deist. A deism was kind of this, uh, not so much a religion, but an outlook on religion that developed during the Enlightenment, where they believed in a God that had created the universe and set it into motion in accordance with natural law. And, and so Franklin liked this. Jefferson seemed to have been influenced by it. Um, Washington remained pretty quiet on his religious views because he was, he was born and raised an Anglican. But here's the problem. Anglican is the Church of England. And so during the Revolution, it, Anglican is almost a byword for loyalist. So not something he's going to really talk about. Okay. Uh, but he might have been influenced by deist views, certainly. All right, let's, let's have some fun. Traitors. Everyone's familiar with Benedict Arnold? What did he do? <laughs> All right. Uh, Benedict Arnold sold us out, right, to the British. He actually was going to sell them the plans to West Point. Um, what most people don't know, and Benedict Arnold, right, is, is almost an American synonym for traitor, right? You know, going back to the primary school schoolyard, right? If you're a traitor, you're a Benedict Arnold. Um, so Arnold, though, before he turned, before he turned, before he sold out, was actually one of Washington's top generals. Uh, he was one of the few that the British actually respected because he tended to win against them. Okay? There's also another traitor that usually doesn't get talked about, though, and I'm going to bring him up, uh, Charles Lee. Charles Lee was Washington's second in command. He's captured by the British in 1776. Now here's the problem. Charles Lee was a former British Army officer. And so he had served in the French and Indian War both here and in Europe. And at the end of that war, he, he goes through Europe, but he does what's it's kind of semi-retirement. He was on what they called half pay. And he comes here, he moves to Virginia, starts a plantation, 
and the Revolutionary War comes, he joins the Patriot side, he says he resigns his commission, and this is, this is kind of technical but kind of important. So when he's captured by the British in 1776, he kind of wants to prove that he, you know, resigned, because if not, and he's a British officer helping the Americans, they hang him. Okay. He spends a couple of years in New York, and he's very nervous for part of that, as you can probably imagine. Right? What are you guys going to do with me? So to try and get in good with the British, he actually wrote, up a, wrote a letter to the commander of the British, William Howe, and he said, here's how I think you can beat the Americans. Okay. Um, so basically he kind of wrote a game plan for the British to defeat us. And this wasn't discovered until the middle of the 1800s. It was found in the New York Public Library. Okay, so this is one reason why you should always spend time in the library, right? You never know what you may find. Um, okay, the French connection. There is no French connection. No. Um, the French connection. Some of you might have heard this idea in your history classes, right, that the, these French soldiers came over here and served at Yorktown, and they got these ideas of liberty and equality, and then they went back to Europe and they started the French Revolution. Well, that's not, it didn't happen the way we might think. Um, there, is a, there is a connection between our revolution and the French Revolution. It's money. Go figure. Um, the French supported us to a very large degree. They provided a lot of material assistance and they provided just a lot of money. And so by 1786, the French national debt had skyrocketed and the king uh, asked his finance minister, the king was Louis XVI, he asked his finance minister, Jacques Necker, right, to, to come up with a report, how, bad, how deep are we in debt? Necker's report basically said, well, sire, we're in so deep that we can barely pay the interest on our debt, and in a few years we won't even be able to do that. So Louis XVI fired him. And if you don't like what your accountant tells you, fire your accountant and get a new one, right? Um, eventually, but eventually all of the debt and the attempts to pay it led to the calling of the Estates General and the French Revolution. Okay. Um, Last, I'd like to talk a little bit about identity and immigration. <laughs> right? We don't often think about this, but a lot of the people who served and helped gain independence weren't born here. Right? Von Steuben is born in Prussia. Um, there's, there's some argument, was he a baron? And his most recent biographer, a guy named Paul Lockhart, uh, basically cleared it up. In Europe, they had come up with this really great idea. If they, wanted to, if they wanted to give you an award, but they didn't want to spend money on you, they came up with this title of nobility called a Freiherr. So you got this title, but you didn't get any money or land. And so he was, and it can translate as baron, which sounds much more impressive. So when von Steuben came over here, he you know, called himself the Baron von Steuben. It went over well. But von Steuben basically standardizes the training for Washington's army and, and makes them a much more effective force. You know, without that, would they have been able to stand against the British by the war's end? Probably not. Okay. Um, Casimir Pulaski, a Polish nobleman who is recognized even today as the founder of the United States Cavalry. Okay. Um, he ends up falling in front of Savannah in 1778. He was leading a cavalry charge trying to drive the British out of the south. The last one I'll mention, though, who get, doesn't get much press at all, Thaddeus Kosciusko. Here's someone who was informed by the revolution. Uh, he's a Polish engineer. He comes over here. What does he do while he's here? Well, how many of you have heard of West Point? He designed it. Okay. Uh, goes back to Poland after our War of Independence and tries to lead an uprising. Poland, by then, uh, you know, is being carved up by Russia, Prussia, Austria. He leads a movement to try and drive the Russians out of Poland. Okay, so he truly was informed by a lot of these revolutionary ideals. Okay, and these ideals of independence and, and freedom for his people. Okay. Um, so, are there any questions? So I've gone on for however many minutes. Yes, Ju Really good question. Was Benedict Arnold successful at selling out West Point? 
Yes and no, um, which actually becomes a fun story of the revolution. Arnold had made this agreement. He was going to meet a British officer named John Andre and provide, them with the, provide Andre with the plans of West Point. Arnold was in command at West Point. And, while he's, and, and people are kind of getting suspicious because while he's in command at West Point, he's like, eh, don't build the walls that thick. Uh, tear down that part of our defense. I don't like it. Like, he's trying to actually weaken things from the inside. Uh, meanwhile, he gets word one morning that Washington is pulling a surprise inspection. George Washington is coming to camp, and he also finds out that John Andre was captured. Uh, he, and so, you know, the, he's in trouble. And so he basically ran, uh, Arnold ran out of his house, jumped in the Hudson River, and swam to a British ship. Um, and meanwhile, when Washington showed up at Arnold's house, his wife, Arnold's wife, Peggy Shippen, uh, kind of accidentally dropped off her blouse. So she was naked from the waist up and kind of distracted Washington for several minutes. Like, my. Um, and so, you know, the, the Americans didn't quite figure out, oh, we've got to get after this guy. For, for a few more minutes. And Ar Arnold actually goes on. He becomes a British general. The British don't like him either. Um, and he led a raid into Virginia later in the war. So, other questions? <laughs> Julian? Yeah. And then, yeah. Kosciusko? Um, so was Thaddeus Kosciuszko successful in leading a Polish revolt against the Russians? No. <laughs> um, he tries very, you know, he tries diligently. He's actually wounded and then imprisoned uh, by the Russians for a time. He's actually courted later on by Napoleon Bonaparte, who kind of wanted someone in Poland to, to be his agent. But to his credit, Kosciuszko saw Napoleon for what he was and said, no, thank you. He actually ended up uh, dying here in Philadelphia in the eight, early 1800s. Yeah. So never was able to disguise himself as Timothy? Yes. And then she got caught? Yes. And she did it again and became Robert? Yes. <laughs> um, in, in, how did, so how did Deborah Sampson dis disguise herself? Um, she did do it twice in the second. Well, she learned from her mistakes. Uh, <laughs> no. No, we don't. Um, again, like a lot of times where we, records aren't complete, where we do have records, um, it, it's, as far as women masquerading as men and serving, uh, there, there's a, a, it goes beyond the American Revolution. It goes back, I, I know at least as far as, the, as Louis XIV in Europe where they actually do. Um, what the main expert on this on this thinks is uh, essentially what a woman would do would be wrap her wrap her chest very tightly, uh, wear baggy clothes, and what they tend to think happens after that once the, if they can get into the unit and nobody notices right away, the the assumption uh, these historians make is that. Uh, their comrades kind of realize something's up, but they would rather have someone they know they can count on. You know, if they've been in combat together, it's like, okay, well, you know, I think she's a woman, but we don't, if we say something, she's gone, and we don't know who, I don't know who's going to be standing next to me next time we're under fire. Um, as far as how did, how did Deborah get away with it, um, most people in colonial America didn't travel much more than 10 miles away from where they were born in their lifetime. So after Deborah masquerades as Timothy and gets caught, she realizes to get away with this, she has to go further from her home than she had previously, and, and that's what she does. She goes about 15 miles away to where the 4th Massachusetts was recruiting. So. Else? Yes. I have a question. You talked about how revolutionary was the revolution. Yeah. Um, that's a, I think, a key question when you think about Hamilton and Hamilton proposing a form of government, and that you have this kind of elite class leading the revolution. 
and sort of allowing people to vote, but then limiting that vote. Could you talk a little bit about you know, how does the American Revolution maybe compare to the French Revolution or other revolutions when you have this kind of elitist trader class, land owning class leading the revolution? Is that a revolution or is it just kicking out the British? Okay, uh, thanks, Troy. That's big a, question, I know. It's a big question. Um, several books on that question <laughs> easily. But uh, uh, one certainly worth uh, uh, taking a uh, crack at answering right now. Um, in comparison to, say, the, the French Revolution or the, the Russian Revolution of 1917, ours were not very radical. Uh, ours would be more of an independence movement where we drive out the occupiers or, or you know, kind of overturn an old, older government that we didn't really care for anymore, but replace it with something eventually that is more representative, but more representative of the elite. I mean, with the fa you know, bar the fact that our executive changes every four years, the, under the original constitution of 1787, most of the people who are being represented are pretty wealthy. They kind of resemble the nobility in England. They own property, lots of it. They have a fair amount of material wealth. Uh, there's no, there's not really an attempt to overturn society, to change social value. I mean, there, you know, what I, what I've hoped to do today with this presentation was point out that some of that is going on. People are talking about what does liberty mean, what does freedom mean, and it's manifesting in some different spots. You know, there's, there's even um, an entry in. John Adams' diary when, you know, he got this letter from Abigail talking about we women have suffered too, we women have contributed to the revolution too. Uh, John Adams wrote in his diary, I fear this, the spirit of liberty has gone where it shouldn't have. You know, he's, John's pretty concerned. And I always say when I talk about this in class, you know, John Adams was at least smart enough to just put it in his diary and not write a letter back to Abigail saying that. You know, he would have come back to Braintree, Massachusetts. You know, why doesn't my key work on the door anymore? Um, but, you know, at, at the time, it's a very conservative change. There's not a change in ideas. There's not an overturning of society. It's a change in government. It's a political legislative thing. It, it had the potential to be a lot more radical. You know, that we often, and I've just been teaching this the past few days, we often forget about the Articles of Confederation that are there for a few years where we really did sort of reject a strong national government, put a lot more power with the states, uh, put a lot more power at, at lower echelons, and really weaken an executive, but kind of quickly learned that as far as a state the size of the U.S. even then goes, that's not going to work. Um, but we created a government in keeping with those ideals, at least for a brief time. So, and again, you know, looking at, say, later revolutions with the French Revolution, you get rid of a monarchy, uh, there's a republic, there's, there's flirtings with communism in the conspiracy of equals. Uh, that, that's much farther. As I mentioned in, in earlier, they attempted to suppress religion. They changed the calendar. You know, I, was, I was talking to one of my classes this morning. The, the French imposed a, a whole new system of weights and measures, right? The metric system. And, and so think about, you know, if all of a sudden in America today, we had to, within the next few weeks, go metric or else. You know, as, as I was saying this morning, I'd probably have to have the conversion chart like tattooed on my forearm, you know. Um, so that's, again, I think much more radical, even though in, in certain aspects it pulls back later on under Napoleon and certainly under the Restoration. And, and even the Russian Revolution, it seems like, though, a pattern, you know, if you stop and think about it, a pattern of revolutions can emerge. And this is one of those big answer type things. When you have these moments where there's a lot of upheaval and a lot of change, there's the, you know, people really push the envelope for a brief time. And then they kind of realize, well, hold it, maybe we need to pull back. And, and so later on, they might sort of pull back in some of those ideas, and it becomes a bit more conservative um, because, again, it's just it's too radical to sustain in the short term. So. That's, that's a big, long-winded answer. Um, any other questions or comments? Yeah. 
<laughs> um, can you repeat that? In, in regards to Hamilton the musical and, and Alexander, well, in Alexander Hamilton's life, yes, they were for the Schuyler sisters. How important were they? Uh, for Alexander Hamilton, they were really important. Um, Philip Schuyler in New York is, is a pretty important figure early on. Um, I, would, I would say this, Alexander Hamilton's relationship with the Schuylers is really an, impo because, an important thing for him and for his later political career because uh, in, in, in politics in that, at that time, and, and even arguably today, right, if you come in as, as a beginner with no connections, you're probably not going to get very far. Uh, Philip Schuyler was, was a very well-connected member of the New York elite. So just having that connection is going to open doors to Hamilton that wouldn't already be, you know, that wouldn't have been opened otherwise. So I would, in that sense, I would say it's a pretty important, pretty important connection for him. And I'd actually go a step further and say that Alexander Hamilton, the politician, knew that for what it was and would exploit it for what it was. You know, it, it's nice that he falls in love. It's cute that he gets married. It makes some great love songs in the musical. But, <laughs> but for Alexander Hamilton as a politician, it's this idea of getting connected, getting plugged into the New York system because he really doesn't have that any other way given his status. So, anyone else? Any other things about the? Yeah, Andrew. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the the question is, were there? You know, I mentioned immigration, and most of the examples I gave were from Eastern Europe. Uh, Prussia and, and Poland to be specific, were there other immigrants from other parts of Europe? Uh, and absolutely there were. I mean, there's, um, there's an, an encyclopedia of French foreign officers who were in Washington's army or who did some service over here during the revolution. And, and so it's an encyclopedia. It's basically a listing with just short biographical statements. And that book is, you know, about two inches thick. Um, there are literally hundreds of them. And, and I, I kind of consciously shied away because most of the time we hear about Lafayette, you know, and, and, and Lafayette is key, um, not so much as a military leader, but Lafayette, he, is, he and his family are connected to the French court at Versailles. Louis XVI knows him like, well, they grew up together to a certain extent. I mean, Louis, Louis is senior, certainly, but Lafayette grew up at Versailles, so, and this is someone who, you know, could, if it were today, he could shoot a text to the king and say, hey, what are you doing next week? Can we grab lunch together and get a reply? And, of course, having that level of connection to the French court is something we really needed. And, and Washington, to his benefit, got that. But there, there are literally hundreds, even thousands of these. Um, which also brings up kind of a problem with it because there were so many of these foreigners, and, and it speaks to the way things worked at that time as well. In, nationalism didn't so much exist yet in Europe. Officers were members of the noble class, and the expectation for a lot of them was that they would be in the military. And so if there weren't any wars going on in Europe, they would be kind of bored. And, you know, looking at their resume going, you know, what have I done lately? So a lot of them literally came over here just for experience sake. And which meant that a lot of the people we got here weren't very good. Uh, but they often asked for lots of money. They asked to outrank Americans. Um, there's, there's one example I can think of, a guy named, uh, uh, an engineer named Philippe de Coudre, who, who showed up, asked Congress, um, or was act actually showed up here and was given by our representative in France, Silas Dean, uh, the, the golden ticket, if you will. You are the commander of the American artillery. Now remember, Silas Dean is, an Im is a diplomat. He has no say on this. And he just, you're the commander of the, of the Continental Artillery and you outrank all Continental Army generals. So he shows up here with this, takes it to Congress in Philadelphia, and they say, um, okay, he takes it to Washington. And Henry Knox and, and Nathaniel Green 
almost resigned over it. <laughs> de Coudre, he made his best contribution to our war effort. He bet another officer that he could swim, swim his horse across the Delaware River. I'm happy to say his horse made it. De Coudre drowned, which ended a lot of the controversy right there. Um, so, and, and again, it makes it a problem because by the time von Steuben shows up, they're, they're looking at a lot of these foreigners with a kind of jaundice eye, like, okay, what can you do for me, really? Um, what helps with von Steuben is he agreed, to, he, he agreed to train Washington's army for free. So it was kind of, well, what do we got to lose? Okay. So very good question. Though. But, and and there, were, there were a number of people who came here. Many of them stayed, too. So we, we probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for the, the, that infusion of a lot of talent and a lot of knowledge. So, Dave. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's a really good question you bring up, Dave. Um, was there a perception of the French as the enemy, and did that cause friction between these French officers and the colonists? To some extent, yes, it certainly did. Um, and it, it depends on, you know, there's the French officers who come over of their own accord. Uh, another factor in this that shouldn't be discounted is religion. The, the colonies are very much Protestant at this point, and the French are Roman Catholic, and many of the wars in Europe were over religion, as we know. Um, and so there's that, pro there's that part of the tension as well. What tends to help things along, uh, many of the French officers, Lafayette is, is just a um, very charismatic guy. He wins over and influences a lot of people in Washington's you know, inner sanctum, inner circle. Likewise, some of these others, like uh, uh, Kosciusko and some of the other more successful French officers, uh, like Madrid de Plessis, are very, they have a lot of good, solid technical skills, and you, know, you can appreciate that. Um, the, the, men, the officers in Washington's army could appreciate those skills, and so you know, we're, we're more than happy to have them after, after a time. The other part of it is when, when the French show up in numbers with Rochambeau's army in, in 1780, um, they pay for things in cash, <laughs> which always wins you friends, right? Uh, there's, and, and the economic situation in America at that time, they had a phrase, worthless as a continental, because the paper money that the Congress was issuing was literally not worth the paper it was printed on. So you can imagine when a group shows up and pays cash, you know, gold, silver, coin, they're going to make friends very quickly, and they did. So, and that helped a lot as well. Other questions, comments? Sir? Okay. How about a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everybody, for coming. Yes, thank you.